And after Spider-Man wrapped up production, it didn't take long for the studios or director Sam Raimi to begin production on the sequel. And so in April of 2002, Sony hired Lethal Weapon 4 and Smallville veterans Alfred Goh and Miles Millar to write a script with Doc Ock, the Lizard, and Black Cat as the villains. Even David Kep was brought back to help, and in the end received absolutely no writing credit for the film, mainly because none of his contributions made it into the finished product. Ha ha! Karma! After the draft by Millar and Go was submitted, which incidentally only featured Doc Ock as a primary antagonist, Michael Shabam was hired to do a second draft. His version featured Harry Osborn putting a $10 million price on Spider-Man's head, and a younger Otto Octavius who becomes obsessed with Mary Jane. His mechanical limbs used endorphins to counteract the pain of being attached to his body, but during a fight with Spider-Man, the limbs become permanently attached, resulting in the fusion slowly starting to kill him. Shaban also made it where Octavius was the creator of the spider that bit Peter in the first movie. And in the end, Octavius' plan would be to remove Spider-Man's spine in order to save him. I'm not sure how that would have worked. I mean, I love Michael Shaban, I really do, but... Shelly Cooper, can you help me out on this one? You know what this is. Yeah, and I reserve this word for those rare instances when it's truly deserved. This is malarkey. <laughs> Yeah, that about covers it. This idea by Shaban was ultimately rejected by Avi Arad, who found the story to be too cliche and unsubtle. After looking through all the drafts, Raimi felt that the film needed to focus on Peter's personal wants versus his responsibilities as a hero, how being Spider-Man would affect his personal life, even stating that this was partly inspired by Superman 2, as that film also explored a hero giving up his responsibilities. Yeah, nice to know this horrendous piece of garbage is good for something. However, since the story was primarily taken from The Amazing Spider-Man number 50, entitled Spider-Man No More, Superman 2 can go fuck itself. However, just like the first film, there were complications with the Writers Guild yet again. Alvin Sargent did a polish on the screenplay by Miles Millar and Alfred Goh, and was in turn given sole screenplay credit. Now before I go on, I do want to talk about something. Months ago, I posted a video on my YouTube page entitled Fear Love Not the Reaper. It was a short film that I made with my fellow classmates from Full Sail. Now, you may notice that in the credits, I am given story credit, but not screenplay credit. The reason for that is because, while I did write the initial screenplay, our professor at the time didn't like it and hired three other writers in the classroom, which included my Issues co-star Jacob Henry, to rewrite it. By the time we filmed it, the only contributions from me that were kept in the shooting script were the names of the characters and the bare bones of the story. And when I say bare, I mean the smallest amount. Therefore, when they didn't give me screenplay credit, I didn't give a shit. It wasn't what I wrote or what I wanted, and just having story credit was fine with me. I would have liked to shoot my screenplay, but that's life. It's a harsh reality that all writers will have to face in the industry. That all being said, fuck you, Writers Guild! Alfred Go and Miles Millar are the true writers of Spider-Man 2. You can even add Raimi's name to that list, but Alvin Sargent barely wrote a damn thing this time around, and only giving Go and Millar story credit alongside Shaban is nothing short of criminal. Everything done with Doc Ock, the love triangle with Peter, Mary Jane, and John Jameson, the continued story of Harry Osborn, the scene at the bank, all of this was written by them, and just about everything else was written by Raimi. The only contribution made by Alvin Sargent was the train fight, which he had incidentally written for the first movie before it was cut out. Story credit my ass. This screenplay is fucking theirs. Even Michael Shaban contacted Miles and Go, two people he had never met before, expressing his outrage that these two were shafted on the screenplay credit. My god, you fucking suck! I'm not saying Alvin Sargent isn't a good writer, nor am I saying he deserved no credit whatsoever. He did complete the final draft with Raimi, but 95% of this damn movie wasn't written by him, and giving him sole screenplay credit for it is a goddamn joke. Alfred Goh and Miles Millar and Sam Raimi wrote Spider-Man 2. You may praise the three of them at your leisure. Anyway, back to the film. It didn't take long for Doc Ock to finally be casted. Upon seeing his work in Frida, Alfred Molina was Raimi's first choice for the role. 
Molina himself didn't even consider himself a contender before getting the call, and was excited to receive the role, being a big fan of Marvel Comics in general. The one thing he wanted to maintain from the comics was Doc Ock's cruel, sardonic sense of humor, and it really pays off. Hand her over! Of course! Easy now! <laughs> Butterfingers! Others were casted, including Daniel Gillies as John Jameson, Donna Murphy as Rosie Octavius, and Dylan Baker as Dr. Connors, who would sadly never become the Lizard in this series of films, but more on that later. It's also noteworthy that the role of Peter Parker was almost recasted. While filming the movie Seabiscuit, Tobey Maguire suffered severe back injuries and was almost replaced by actor Jake Gyllenhaal. I wouldn't have minded this, as Jake is a far superior actor than Toby, but to McGuire's credit, when he considered himself good enough to film, he was able to reprise his role. So, yeah, McGuire, I don't think you're a great actor, but respect. While the original title of the film was given the name The Amazing Spider-Man, with the third film intended to be called The Spectacular Spider-Man, the studios decided to scrap that idea and just name the film Spider-Man 2 at the last minute. Yeah, I guess they thought audiences would be confused about this being a sequel if we didn't see the number two on the title. It's the Hollywood way. So, after all that, what do I think of Spider-Man 2? Well, I gotta be honest here, guys. So, let's just get the stuff I didn't like out of the way first. You serious? <laughs> no, I'm just fucking with you. There is not a thing I didn't like in this film. It is that damn good. Yes, I like this over the Avengers, over Dark Knight, over the Incredible Hulk, over Iron Man 3. I love those movies, but none of them come close to the sheer amount of heart demonstrated in this film. There is another thing that factors in, though, and I will go into more extensive detail about it when I finally review The Dark Knight, hopefully before the year 2039, but at this point, I make no promises. In The Dark Knight, Nolan's approach was to make everything dark, gritty, and all too serious. Now, making things dark, gritty, serious, and therefore a bit more adult is not a bad thing. That's actually a pretty cool approach, but with The Dark Knight, he made everything so dark, so gritty, and so damn serious that, at least to me, Nolan sucked the fun straight out of it. He made a Batman crime drama that was badass and memorable, but that I struggled to have much fun with. In my opinion, there is no reason that a comic book film should sacrifice the fun of its central character in order to make everything so serious. You should be able to balance the two out well. And Spider-Man 2 is the fucking poster child for what I'm talking about. It is adult. It is serious. It does focus on the personal life of the character. But never once, not once, is this film not fun to sit through. In fact, it's quite a blast. There is never a dull moment in the film. Even when it has to slow down a bit to focus on character development, the heart and soul of the story is so great that it is a chore not to be entertained. I love Spider-Man 2. Now, let's focus on what this film is about. It takes place two years after the first film, and Peter finds his personal life in a downward spiral being so busy as Spider-Man that he even forgets his own birthday. On top of that, his grades are declining, his friendships with Mary Jane and Harry are on the rocks, and he can't even hold a normal job due to his heroic responsibilities. We see the toll that being Spider-Man takes on Peter, doing the right thing on a daily basis and getting shunned for it every step of the way. Peter has to juggle being a superhero with having a personal life. But being a hero turns his personal life into hell. And eventually, it gets to the point where Peter gives up being Spider-Man, putting Uncle Ben's words, with great power comes great responsibility, to the test. He tosses the suit in the trash in a nice homage to Superman No More in order to focus on his own life as a man. He never asked to be Spider-Man. Why should his life have to suffer? Why can't he have what he wants? 
and his life actually improves. His grades go up, he reconnects with his friends, everything is looking up for him. But unfortunately, this leads to the city suffering. With no Spider-Man to protect the city, the crime rate goes up exponentially. And since he's the only one who can help, this causes an even bigger internal conflict for Peter, which is not only well written, but incredibly relatable. Let me ask you this. When we try as hard as we can to do the right thing, and none of our efforts are appreciated, how many of us have thought about saying, you know what, fuck it, I'm throwing in the towel? It's here that Peter finally realizes what Uncle Ben meant when he talked about power and responsibility, but perhaps the biggest influence to become Spider-Man again in the film comes from this wonderful monologue from Aunt May, which, I'm just gonna say it, is the single greatest and heartfelt moment in any comic book film. He knows a hero when he sees one. Too few characters out there flying around like that, saving old girls like me. Lord knows, kids like Henry need a hero. Courageous, self-sacrificing people, setting examples for all of us. Everybody loves a hero. People line up for them, cheer them, scream their names, and years later they'll tell how they stood in the rain for hours just to get a glimpse of the one who taught him to hold on a second longer. I believe there's a hero in all of us that keeps us honest, gives us strength, makes us noble, and finally allows us to die with pride, even though sometimes we have to be steady and, and give up the thing we want the most. Even our dreams. Spider-Man did that for Henry, and he wonders where he's gone. He needs him. Peter finally realizes that despite the problems it causes in his personal life, being Spider-Man is the right thing to do. And if that means having to give up his dreams, the love of his life, or having a life in general, then so be it. That is a true hero. The story of Peter Parker and Spider-Man in this film is nothing short of masterful. The story of Dr. Octavius is done beautifully as well. The film makes him a sympathetic character that you can understand, and the parallel between him and Peter is magnificent. By the end of the film, Doc Ock is forced to learn what Peter learns throughout the movie, that sometimes doing the right thing means having to give up what you want the most. Octavius wants to see his dream of a successful fusion reaction brought to life. And when the AI arms take control of his mind and body, he goes through achieving this goal by any means, even kidnapping Mary Jane and threatening the lives of Harry Osborn and Peter Parker, the latter of which he mentored in the beginning of the film. I want you to find your friend, Spider-Man. Tell him to meet me at the West Side Tower at 3 o'clock. Well, I don't know where he is. Find him. Or I'll peel the flesh off her bones. If you lay one finger on her, you'll do that. Speaking of which, that scene of them together talking about love, T.S. Eliot, and science is one of the most memorable scenes in the movie, as we see Octavius influencing Peter in the beginning, while at the end it is Peter who influences Octavius. When Octavius realizes that achieving his dream will mean causing the deaths of half the citizens in New York, he sacrifices not just his dream, but himself, in order to make it right. While there was that emotional aspect to the character, Molina also manages to bring a humorous side to him that was a great addition, as it balances out the seriousness and fun nature of the villain perfectly without making everything too serious. Speaking of villains who will do anything to obtain what they desire, James Franco returns to play Harry Osborn, as he is now looking for revenge on Spider-Man, believing it was Spider-Man who killed his father. He's filled with so much hatred that even when Spider-Man saves him in the film, he responds thusly. You saved your life, sir. He humiliated me by touching me. 
I think my two favorite scenes with this character were the unmasking of Spider-Man, as he did have the perfect reaction. He looks angry, scared, and shocked all at the same time. And when Peter begins talking to him, it's like he doesn't know how to react to what he's discovered. That is great acting. The other scene is the hallucination of his father telling Harry to avenge him. This whole scene was actually thought up by Willem Dafoe, who was inspired by King Hamlet haunting his son to avenge him. All in all, it's creepy and works disturbingly well. All leading up to Harry finding his father's old lair and discovering that his father was indeed the Green Goblin. This would mostly prove to be time filler for the next movie, but we'll get to that in the next video. Now I could go on a tangent about Maguire and Dunst and their acting ability like I did in the last video, but honestly, the dialogue in this movie is so damn good, their acting did not bother me at all. Which is more than I can say for the first film or the one to follow. The action scenes in this film are utterly breathtaking. That whole train scene was glorious to behold, as are all the fights with Octavius. Sam Raimi brought his A-game with this movie, and it truly showed. What else can I say? Spider-Man 2 is perfectly written, perfectly played out, perfectly directed, and all tied together with a gorgeous score by Danny Elfman. There was not a damn thing in this movie that didn't work for me. Oh, and it also led to one of the most badass video games ever. Seriously, if you have not played this game, I fucking pity you. Spider-Man 2, to this day, remains not just the greatest Spider-Man movie of all time, but one of the greatest comic book films of all time on top of that, and receives my highest recommendation. Overall rating, A+.